This meeting is being recorded. All right. I want to just thank everybody for joining us today. My name is Jennifer Lombardo. Um, I work in our community relations department at Rothman Orthopedics. Um, I hope everyone is staying safe and trying to get back to um, somewhat of normalcy out there. Um, we normally hold these lectures in person, um, but obviously under the circumstances, we've been doing some virtual lectures, and they've actually been um, worked really well. We've been recording the lectures um, as well, so then afterwards we can email the, the recording out to everybody in attendance and you know, feel free to review it again or you can always forward along to somebody else who may be interested. Um, our lecture today will be given by Dr. Dan Siegerman. Dr. Siegerman is one of our hand and wrist surgeons at Rothman Orthopedics. He currently sees patients at our offices in Manhattan at our Gramercy location and also in Westchester County in Harrison. Um, his topic he will be speaking on today is my hand hurts and I don't know why. Um, if we are going to do the lecture first, then we're going to take some Q&A afterwards. So if you have any questions, please feel free to type it into the chat section at the bottom of the screen. And then Dr. Siegerman will get to any of the questions after the lecture. Um, or also you can unmute yourself afterwards and feel free to ask the question out loud. Um, but just a reminder, if everybody can keep your phone um, or your computer audio on mute um, during the presentation just to avoid interruption. All right. We're ready to go. All right. So, <clears throat> can everybody see my screen and, and hear me okay? Yes. Okay, yes. great. So, um, today's topic uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. And, Jen, thanks for the introduction. Um, you know, this is a tough time, but uh, we've been doing some of these, and it's been nice to engage with some of our patients and, and our community. So this lecture is called My Hand Hurts and I Don't Know Why. And realistically, it's just a compilation of sort of the most common things that I see as a hand and upper extremity and microvascular surgeon. So <clears throat> hand problems occur in, in basically everybody, in our young and older population, in our heavy laborers, in our business people. Uh, and it also occurs on, you know, in, in professional and amateur athletes. So Everyone has hands and they all, all the fingers get injured and, and it's sort of a ubiquitous population that I treat, unlike some of my colleagues who only treat sort of kids or, or, or older folks. Um, and I break down what I see into a number of different categories. And so many reasons why patients come to see a hand surgeon or a hand doctor, um, and, and most of it is not for surgery. Most of it is just to deal with some of these problems that they, that they face. So the main topics that I see are, are patients complaining of numbness and tingling, uh, tendon problems, arthritis, and acute injuries that, that lead to, to fractures. And I've listed some of the major things here, uh, but we'll go through them in some detail. So we'll start off with the most popular thing that I see, and that's called carpal tunnel syndrome. Carpal tunnel syndrome is a super popular uh, entity. It's sort of a household um, um, word that we hear. And, and many people who think that, you know, when they have hand or wrist problems, they think it, they automatically think it's carpal tunnel because it's that common. Um, but realistically, let's talk about what it is. It's a nerve problem. So most of the comp, most of uh, the nerves that enter into the hand, uh, we call them peripheral nerves. And all nerves come from your brain, they enter into your spinal cord, and then they differentiate as they enter the arms and the legs. And the specific nerve that we're talking about when we talk about carpal tunnel syndrome is the median nerve at the wrist. <clears throat> so what does the median nerve do? You need to know what the median nerve does so that you can see if, if there's a problem with that nerve uh, leading to carpal tunnel syndrome. So the median nerve supplies sensation to this portion of the, of the hand. Typically, it's the radial three and a half digits or the thumb, index, middle, and part of the ring's uh, finger. It is predominantly and entirely on the palmer side of the hand. So patients with numbness, tingling, and discomfort on the top side or dorsal side of the hand, usually it's not carpal tunnel syndrome. So we're talking about the palm side of the hand here. And <clears throat> like I mentioned, numbness and tingling within the thumb, index, long finger, and half of the ring finger. Many of my patients with carpal tunnel syndrome complain of nighttime disturbances, uh, and they're actually waking up from sleep uh, to shake their hands uh, out to alleviate some of the discomfort. 
Um, and then if it gets bad enough, that numbness is more persistent and can lead to feelings of clumsiness and even weakness of the thumb. When you come to the office and, and I have a, a suspicion that you may have carpal tunnel syndrome, the first thing I'll do is a pretty comprehensive physical examination. And there are a number of different uh, exam maneuvers that we can do in the office to uh, elicit carpal tunnel syndrome. One of which is we tap right on the palm, right over the area of the carpal tunnel. Another uh, way that we can elicit discomfort or, or uh, sort of bring out carpal tunnel is when we ask patients to flex their wrists sort of like this. So the re this is a praying position, we do the reverse praying position. And that can also, holding it in that position for about 30 to 60 seconds can elicit some discomfort. And finally, there's objective testing. That's called an EMG or a, a nerve conduction test. <clears throat> Looks similar to what's going on in this picture, where we place little electrodes into the hand and arm, and we stimulate muscles and nerves to see how fast they travel. And if they get slowed down in the area of the palm where the carpal tunnel is, we sort of have good evidence that you have carpal tunnel syndrome. Many people come in uh, and they say that their left hand is numb and their right hand is not, but they're a righty and they're confused about that. Um, and, and so there's no difference with respect to which hand uh, you may get carpal tunnel syndrome in, uh, depending on hand dominance. And that was done with a large study done actually at the Rothman Institute by some of my colleagues. <clears throat> Non-operative treatment uh, is usually started first once we make the diagnosis, and typically we start with using a splint. The splint, what that does is it holds your wrist in a neutral position. It doesn't allow for excessive bending. Uh, and if we hold the wrist in a neutral position, especially at night when we're sleeping, we take the pressure off the nerve. It doesn't get as compressed as typical when, when we sleep in, in different positions and rest on our hands. And typically that gives you some decent relief throughout the day uh, and can subside your symptoms significantly. In patients with mild symptoms uh, or patients where the test, the EMG test is negative, sometimes we give a cortisone injection. That is uh, typically excellent for relieving uh, symptoms, but oftentimes it's only short lived. If somebody has carpal tunnel syndrome and they have tried a brace, uh, some medication, um, and they have tried uh, other non-operative modalities like we just talked about, the, the way to fix the problem is to do a small surgical procedure. As you can see here, the nerve is compressed under a ligament structure here. And that roof is called the transverse carpal ligament. Over time, the space in that tunnel gets too tight. So what we end up doing, during a small surgery, we open up that ligament and allow the nerve to breathe free, and it increases your, it improves your symptoms significantly. Here's a couple of surgical pictures. If you don't wanna see surgical pictures, you can just tune out for about 30 seconds here. But this is, uh, this second line here is about the size of the incision that is made on your palm. We carefully open up the palm area here and we expose and release the transverse carpal ligament. And underneath, you can see here that the nerve is now breathing free. A couple of stitches, a light bandage, and you're able to move your fingers right away. The whole procedure takes about 10 minutes. It's done safely in an outpatient facility under a light sedation and some local anesthesia. How do people do once they have carpal tunnel surgery? So it's one of the greatest operations that we have available to us because it has over 90% satisfaction rate. There's reliable improvement with respect to numbness and pain, and some improvement potentially with some weakness that, that occurs. It is though important to remember that if you have really advanced carpal tunnel syndrome, the goal is to improve the, the motor strength to not make it get any worse. Sometimes it's hard to restore muscles that have withered away over years. Like any other surgery, there's, there's some risks. In this particular instance, it includes infection, which is way less than 1%. And the biggest thing we worry about is that your symptoms may not completely go away. But like we mentioned, over 90% satisfaction rate, all comers. So we'll move on to probably the second most common thing that I see in my practice, and that's called trigger finger. 
another uh, sort of term that many people know throughout the community. It's important to figure out what trigger finger is, and realistically, it's sort of a tendonitis of the flexor tendon sheath in your fingers. So if you look at your fingers, as you bend them down, each of your fingers, with the exception of your thumb, have two tendons. And they run in a pulley system. If we didn't have that pulley system, you can imagine that the tendons would sort of migrate towards the palm. I like to uh, uh, compare this to a fishing pole that you see here. So the fishing pole has eyelets and the fishing line runs through those eyelets. The reason why the fishing pole has that is to keep the line close to the fishing pole and act like a pulley system. And that's exactly what we have going on in your, in your hand, in your fingers. If by chance there's too much mass or too much inflammation around the tendons and the pulleys get too tight, what can happen is you can flex your fingers down, but you have a hard time bringing it back up. And that's called trigger finger. Oftentimes patient looks like this individual here. There can be pain at the base of the, of the finger over an area that we call the A1 pulley region. You can also experience a nodule there. And what will happen is oftentimes worse in the morning and it gets better throughout the day, but you'll wake up and one of your fingers will be stuck down. You actually have to really force it and it triggers up or you actually have to use your other hand to pop it up. And that's because of what we described on the, on the previous slide. What causes this? A bit unclear. Uh, could be traumatically related, but oftentimes it's sort of idiopathic. It just happens. We do know though that there is a reasonable association with diabetes and hypothyroidism, as well as some other inflammatory conditions. But most of my patients do not have these underlying medical conditions with trigger finger. So how is it treated? The first thing that we do is we give anti-inflammatory medications. We can try some splinting or therapy, but the mainstay of treatment is a cortisone injection. 60 to 70% of people who obtain one cortisone injection can be cured indefinitely. Uh, and they won't need any surgery procedure or any, any more uh, um, treatment. I just did a large study uh, spanning over the course of a year looking at our patients in our practice who have been treated with a cortisone injection. And what our preliminary data, although it's not published yet, sort of hot off the press, we see that people usually get better with respect to their pain in about three to three and a half days, and their triggering starts to go away within about a week. But more to come on that, uh, that uh, article is sort of in review right now. We're hoping to get that published soon. Surgery, if you have an injection or two injections and you still have some triggering, there is a surgical intervention that can be very, very successful. We do, is we do it under a wide awake local anesthetic or with a light sedation. We make a small incision here at the, in your palm, and we release the tendon sheet that we showed in that earlier slide to allow the tendon to glide freely. So probably the next most common type of tendonitis that I see is an entity called Decorvain's tenosynovitis. And that's just a very fancy way to say tendonitis at the uh, outside area of your wrist. What is it? So your tendons that allow you to lift your thumb and lift your fingers and wrist up come in six separate compartments and we call them dorsal compartments. The first dorsal compartment harbors two tendons and they also run in tendon sheets similar to uh, trigger finger. Um, you can get tendonitis in the first dorsal compartment tendon and typically if you see my hand here, you have pain that arises from this side, from the distal portion of your forearm and into the thumb. It's always on the thumb side. Usually a new type of repetitive activity is, is what causes this. And it's typically known, known, at, known for new moms, new dads, new grandmas, new grandpas, because we're often picking up these, these little kids and in this position that this gentleman is picking up this little girl. And you can see that the wrist is in sort of a extended position and can put stress on some of those tendons. There's a very sensitive and specific test that we use in the office called the Finkelstein's test, and you can all do it right now. Basically what you do is you take your thumb and you put it into your palm, you close your fingers on top, 
and then you just deviate your wrist away from your thumb. That causes significant pain along the top side or dorsal side, dorsal radial side of your, of your wrist. Sort of telltale sign that this is decorbane's tenosynovitis. Super common, I see it almost every time I see patients in the office, and oftentimes corticosteroid injections are extraordinarily helpful. Um, <clears throat> leads me to this slide. So we start with some anti-inflammatory medication. Splinting can be helpful, especially if it includes a thumb. But the mainstay here, again, is a corticosteroid injection. Inject the steroid into that tendon sheath to hopefully reduce some of the bulk within the tendon sheath, and that's extraordinarily helpful. In the small population, about 25-30% of patients, when we try the injection, we try the splint, and that doesn't sort of knock this out permanently, there's a small surgical intervention, again, can be done under either a local anesthetic or under a sedation type of anesthetic, and can be curative by releasing the, the tendon sheath for that tendon group. Moving on to tennis elbow. Tennis elbow is extraordinarily common. Most patients that I have with tennis elbow have never played tennis before though. So it's sort of a misnomer. But what it is, is it's called lateral epicondylitis. The, the muscles and tendons that attach to the outside portion of your elbow out here allow you to lift your wrist and fingers up in the air. So they, they're responsible for extension. And most of what we, do, what we do during our day, whether it's typing or shaking hands or just living, is holding things in wrist extension. So it's not surprising to know that you can get some tendonitis at the outside portion of your elbow. What causes it? So overuse and repetitive activities such as tennis. Um, people who use uh, uh, power tools or hammers uh, can often get this for that repetitive extension um, activity of the wrist. Um, it's typically seen in 30 to 50 year olds who are super active. And this could be a real bear. Um, so uh, just to, to let you know what you may have, it may be an athlete, you may not be an athlete. And interestingly, patients typically talk about pain that starts in the outside area of the elbow and trickles down the forearm. Worse with gripping. Some treatment remedies, we do some activity modifications. So if you can stop uh, using the hammer, or stop using the tennis racket, we encourage you to do so. Over-the-counter anti-inflammatory medications are extremely helpful. Bracing, there are two different types of braces that we use. One is sort of uh, depicted here in this picture. We use a band. You've see, probably seen people in the community with bands over the outside of your elbow. What that does is that's called a counterforce brace and that will, um, change the position by which the extensor tendons are pulling on the bone on the outside of the elbow. Another type of brace is a simple wrist brace, which will prevent ex um, excessive extension of the, of the wrist, which pulls on the area of the outside of the elbow. Physical therapy and stretching activities are extraordinarily helpful. And steroid injections, as well as PRP injections, show some promise as well. This is an entity that gets better predominantly with non-operative management. It's pretty rare for me to have to do surgery on someone with tennis elbow. And I do so only a few times a year just because it's not that common that someone will need uh, surgery for this type of problem. Much of this non-operative care actually works quite well. So we're gonna move away from some of the uh, tendonitis uh, uh, type of uh, entities that we see. Now I'm gonna talk about uh, the most common type of arthritis that I see, and that's called uh, thumb arthritis at the CMC joint or basal joint arthritis of the thumb. It is the most common arthritis of the hand, and basically it's a wear and tear arthritis, or can be inflammatory arthritis, but typically wear and tear arthritis uh, at the base of the thumb. If you see here in this x-ray, you can see this individual has uh, wearing away of the cartilage at the base of the thumb where I'm showing my cursor here. Uh, and that's classic for the x-ray. We see this more often in women than men. Um, and people with a lot of joint laxity, this is a very mobile joint. So over the years, as you're loading this joint and moving it excessively, you can have significant wearing away of the cartilage. Um, we often see patients with really, really, really significant basal joint arthritis on x-ray, but their clinical symptoms are not as bad. 
So obviously we take care of the patient, not the x-ray. And so if it's not that bad clinically, you're not having too much pain, despite having pretty significant x-rays, we just treat you as such, and you don't need any sort of aggressive treatment for that. Many people do, though, have discomfort at the base of the thumb when they have bad arthritis there. And it can be hard to pinpoint. Some people say it bothers them with opening jars and doors, returning keys and writing, fine motor skill, and things involving pinch. Uh, and that usually leads them to my office. Treatment, like met much of the other uh, things that we've talked about today, involve non-operative care first. Uh, the same uh, list of things, such as uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication, those are your Aleve, Advil, uh, ibuprofen. Activity modification, try to change your ways a bit. Splinting with a thumb spike orthosis like we see here in this picture. Uh, and a cortisone injection is, is extremely helpful as well. If that doesn't solve the problem, there is a surgery that can significantly help the symptoms. And what we do during that surgery is we remove the arthritic area. And as you can see in this picture here, we actually remove the entire bone that's causing a problem. So the arthritis is between the trapezium bone as seen here and the first metacarpal base. And what we do is we remove that bone and we use a variety of different techniques to stabilize this joint. Super, super successful operation. This is uh, a patient of mine who had a bad bilateral basal joint arthritis. And you can see the joint spaces here are nice and open. As you look all around here, the joints looks nice and open. But as you look here, this joint here is really, really tight. This joint here is really, really tight. Both are bone on bone arthritis. And what we did on this side, this side was just as bad as, as this side. We removed that bone and now there's a nice space between the two. And there's a soft tissue reconstruction here that you just can't see on x-ray. So we'll move into the final part of this uh, lecture, and that's talking about fractures. Much of what I do involves the emergency room and, and traumatic injuries. And so I see a lot of wrist fractures every single year and a lot of finger fractures as well. Uh, it counts for about a sixth of all fractures seen in the emergency room, which is a pretty high number. More commonly in the older population, but certainly we see this in all ages from children up to our elderly population. The mechanism is usually a fall onto an outstretched wrist. Uh, and uh, what we do is we, you know, many of these patients present to an urgent care facility, sometimes to our office or the emergency room. And we look at x-rays uh, as there's typically a deformity in the wrist. If you look at the wrist as what we call a dinner fork deformity, and we obviously get some x-rays to see what's going on. And you can see here with the white arrows, there's a break in the bone here, and this bone is called the distal radius. This bone is also broken, this is the ulna, and there's usually a small break up here, but that's less important than this main fracture here called the distal radius fracture. And what we do in the emergency setting is we usually reduce this or set the bones into a more acceptable position. We apply a splint and then we reassess new x-rays to see if the fracture is amenable to being healed in that position with the splint on or whether the fracture is not in an acceptable position and would need further surgical intervention. So there's a number of radiographic entities that we use uh, as orthopedic doctors and hand surgeons to um, assess whether someone needs surgery after a, a distal radius fracture. If it's a really displaced fracture, meaning the bony particles are not aligned properly, then oftentimes that needs an operation. Or if the fracture involves the joint surface, oftentimes we would recommend surgery to improve upon the alignment of the fracture. In the first uh, example, we did, you know, we are often able to put the bones back, set them, and then we place a cast like this. It can be one of many colors. Uh, and that, that fracture is usually held with this cast, and then we get it moving in about four to five weeks. Sometimes surgery is necessary, and what we sometimes do is use this plate and screw construct to realign the fracture, apply the plate in an appropriate position, and hold everything in place. The advantages to surgery is that it allows for some early range of motion and we restore alignment pretty nicely. Fractures of the hand are also common, especially in active individuals. There's a lot of different bones in the hand. Some of them are called the carpal bones. Then you have your metacarpal bones, which are 
prime targets for fractures. And then we have lots of little bones here called the phalanx bones. And we see fractures involving all these joints and all these uh, different bones all the time. Um, this is a non-displaced fracture in a child. And you can see there's a crack that goes right through the bone here. And while it's broken, the alignment is perfect. The patient looks perfect on examination. They're able to bend and, and, and open. And there's no rotational abnormality. And so this patient would be amenable to a splint or a cast, and they did quite well. Sometimes, though, the fractures are unstable. So if you look here at this wrist, this is a side view of someone's hand and wrist. You can see as you come here, this bone is sort of poking out of where it should be. And that's not a good idea. You got to get that back where it belongs and fix that fracture more appropriately. And that's what was done here. So this metal plate and screw construct is used to hold the bone in place. And this patient healed up quite nicely uh, and uneventfully. The most, carp the most common carpal bone fracture that we see is something called the scaphoid fracture. That's a really interesting bone because it's covered completely, almost circumferentially in cartilage. And the reason why that's so important is that it doesn't have the best blood supply. So when we have a fracture through a bone like this, oftentimes we like to fix it with a screw to hold things in better position. And that's what was done for this particular individual. So in summary, there are many causes for hand and wrist pain. Most of what I see and what I, what I treat can be treated without surgery. But when those, those types of treatment uh, measures don't work, there's often a surgery that can help you know, cure the problem indefinitely. Thank you so much. We're happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Siegerman. Again, if anybody has any questions, feel free to type it in the chat section um, again, or you can unmute yourself and ask it out loud. I just want to thank you for the presentation. I found it very interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I have a quick question. Um, my name's Rachel. I'm an OT hand therapist. Um, thank you so much for the presentation also. Just a quick question about the trigger finger surgeries that you discussed. Um, mm -hmm. When you described how it's um, under sedation, not full anesthesia, is this considered a wallet procedure? Like a wide awake? That's a great question. So it can be, it's really the patient's preference. I'm certainly comfortable doing, doing it under wallet. That's wide awake local anesthesia without a tourniquet. Um, so uh, I, we can do that. It's a sort of a discussion that we have with the patient. There are many patients who want to be wide awake for the surgery and, you know, we create a very comfortable environment. We oftentimes put their music choice on in the room and we have a discussion and we talk about the operation as it's happening, as well as the post-operative care. Uh, but there's also a good portion of patients who are not comfortable with that and they would rather sort of be sleeping or sleepy at least. Um, and, and that's really up to the patient. So that's a discussion that I have once someone is indicated for that procedure. We discuss how they'd like to have the anesthesia por portion of it. Uh, and it's really uh, their choice. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, doctor. It was an excellent presentation. I've had surgery for two trigger fingers on my left hand previously. I've gone the route of cortisone injections. I wore the braces, but still in all, the uh, result, I had to have surgery. Now I'm demonstrating a trigger finger on my right hand, the, uh, the center, the middle finger. And when I get up in the morning, it is extremely painful. I physically have to open it. By lunchtime, sometimes it's doable, but I find now that I have a problem opening jars. Now, I do have an appointment with a hand specialist at Rothman in Limerick, Pennsylvania. And I don't know if I have the patience to go the route of the injections and the braces when I know where it will result. Is... is are these occurrences something that happen more with a lot of use with your hands? I am an avid knitter, 
and for long periods of time, maybe an hour or two, my hands will actually be in the same position. Is that a contributing factor to the problem? You know, it can be. Um, you know, like I mentioned, we don't really know why some people get trigger finger. Certainly there's uh, traumatic things or repetitive use things like you're describing. Uh, there's also things like diabetes and thyroid uh, abnormalities that can lead to uh, a trigger finger, you know, or more common, commonly to have trigger finger when you have those, those uh, types of medical conditions. But the answer is probably yes. You know, some of the things that you're doing may lead to um, uh, uh, trigger finger or worsening trigger finger. And what you described as far as uh, it bothering you in the morning is really common. So many of my patients have a significant trigger finger when they wake up in the morning and throughout the day it gets a little bit better. As far as the treatment measure, like I mentioned uh, previously, you know, it's sort of a patient dis decision and it's, and it's a discussion. I've had a number of patients who are very similar to you. They, they went the injection route uh, and then they ended up needing surgery. And then if it shows up on the other hand, they sometimes want to go right to surgery and, and sort of skip those first steps. And that's really an individual decision between that patient and doctor. Um, and so uh, that, that's a reasonable discussion that, that you probably will end up having with, with the provider that you see uh, down in Limerick. I appreciate your information. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Dr. Sigmund, we have another question. Um, what help is there for curving index finger and lumps on the top joint on that finger? And also what's best for swelling fingers, mostly in human conditions? So um, the, the bump that we're talking about on the top side of the finger at the last joint, that's often associated with some arthritis and you can develop a little cyst there. Um, without seeing the finger, it's a little bit difficult to tell, but the most common uh, thing that what I think is being described, is something called the mucus cyst. Um, and depending on how bad it is, those can be addressed with either uh, a simple aspiration uh, or a small surgical procedure where you uh, correct the problem. Um, but much of what is done is based on how bad any underlying arthritis is and the underlying problem. Um, as far as uh, swelling of the fingers with humidity, uh, that can vary from person to person. Certainly, um, if it's really, really bad, we, we would rule out um, some other medical uh, conditions as well as arthritic conditions. But some swelling with humidity uh, and those folks who wear rings will see that the rings get tight when it gets humid out. That's, that's really common. Okay, another question. I have pain in my wrist on the pinky side. It doesn't fit anything that you mentioned. What else, could it be anything else? Yeah, that's great. That, that's something probably uh, called ulnar sided wrist pain. So the pinky side of the wrist is called the ulnar side of the wrist. And ulnar side of the ulnar side of wrist pain is a large group of problems uh, that are super, super common um, and, and uh, almost ubiquitous that we see all the time. Um, some common things that exist out there are TFCC tears, or the triangular fibrocartilage complex, um, and other tendinous type problems on the outside of the wrist. It's probably the, the only thing that, that is really, really common that I didn't talk about today. So um, certainly that, that's a really common problem. But on the side of wrist pain is, is, is a very common problem that I see. Another question. Any thoughts about carpal instability? Was diagnosed with 15 years ago with CIND with a mild collapse. Yeah, so there's, that's a very specific uh, question for a specific person. Obviously, um, that would need to be looked at a little bit more closely with an x-ray and a physical examination as some, sometimes things are mild, sometimes things are not so mild, and things progress over the course of 15 years. So um, the person who asked that question probably would, should, should see you know, an orthopedic hand surgeon um, and, and get a baseline from there. Okay, another question. I used to do a lot of cross stitch, but lately my hand is so swollen that I can't even make a fist. What can I do? I'm sorry, you said they did a lot of cross? Cross, cross stitch. stitch. Oh, cross stitch. You know, swelling of the hands can come from a variety of different things. Um, oftentimes, uh, it's from arthritis. It depends on the person's age and, and their activity level. Um, and so, you know, a, a comprehensive evaluation to find the underlying root cause of the swelling is essential. 
Um, so swelling can be from a tendonitis type problem. It can be from arthritis. It can be from more of a medical condition. So a lot of these things are pretty quickly picked up on either an x-ray or, or a comprehensive exam. Uh, so that's one, that's a person that probably should be seen. Okay. Uh, do you do PRP therapy for arthritis? We do. You know, um, the PRP data is sort of new. Um, we are doing it here in our office. We also have um, uh, every area of orthopedics here in, 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 at Rothman, New York. Um, and so some of my non-operative partners, Dr. Rubish, is really spearheading a lot of that. And so a lot of the PRP injections I send to Dr. Rubish, as he, she's an expert in that. And we work together uh, to, to give PRP injections where appropriate. Okay, awesome. If anybody else has any additional questions, you can always email me afterwards and I will work with Dr. Siegerman to get your questions answered. Um, but again, just to mention, if anybody joined us late, um, Dr. Siegerman, um, one of our hand and wrist surgeons, he practices at our offices in Manhattan, um, in Gramercy, and also in um, Harrison and Westchester County. We are currently doing Kelly visits, but we are also seeing patients in the office. Um, I sent our scheduling phone number in the chat. Um, but if, and again, if anybody has any questions or needs to schedule an appointment with Rothman um, for our New York locations, you can reach us at 646-891-5540. Um, I will send the um, recording of the presentation out to everybody probably sometime tomorrow. And again, feel free to forward along to anybody if you like. If you have any additional questions, again, feel free to always reach out to me directly and I can help with that. But again, I just want to thank everybody for joining us and I hope you have a great day. Thanks, Dr. Siegerman. Thanks, Jen. The other one other thing, uh, our Tarrytown office is actually opening the first week of July. So oh, right. um, that, that has been closed because of the COVID-19 crisis, but we're really excited to open back up the, uh, the Tarrytown office as well. Awesome. Yes, thank you. Great. Thanks again, everyone. Have thank a great day. Much. Thank you. You're welcome.